Greetings readers, I'm Audrey Chapuy, the director of the American Library in Paris. Welcome to Evenings with an Author, sponsored by Grow at Annenberg. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett here to speak about her book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. And this is the UK edition. I have to tell you that I'm a huge fan of this book. It's actually the gift that I gave most often in 2020. Uh, and you don't have to be a scientist or a lay person obsessed by the brain like me to appreciate this work. Uh, Dr. Feldman Barrett is an exquisite prose stylist. So if you enjoy clear, insightful writing about human nature, I guarantee that you will love this book. Um, so just a note about the American Library in Paris. We are both a physical and virtual library built by and for readers from all over the world. And we are currently celebrating our centennial. So it's a moment to appreciate everyone who makes the library possible. So the authors and audience in this Zoom room, our members and our donors, uh, I thank you all for making this conversation possible. And thank you for being here tonight. So now back over to Gabby McFarland to introduce our speaker for this evening. Enjoy. Thank you, Audrey. Um, as mentioned tonight, we are delighted to be hosting doc Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett for a reading and conversation about her latest book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Breaking down myths about nature versus nurture to lizard brain, Dr. Barrett gifts us with a new understanding of the structure and function of the human brain and its influence on us as well as our relationships with others. A university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University with appointments at Harvard Medical School in Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Barrett is among the top 1% of most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. In addition to seven and a half lessons about the brain, Dr. Barrett is author of How Emotions Are Made, as well as six academic volumes published by Guilford Press and over 240 published peer-reviewed scientific papers appearing in Science, Nature, Neuroscience, and other prestigious journals. Joining us here tonight from Boston, welcome Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Thank you so much. So greetings everyone from sunny Boston. Um, good evening to you. Thank you so much to Audrey for this invitation and for to Gabby for that lovely introduction. What I'm gonna do uh, this evening is read to you from the seventh lesson of the final lesson of seven and a half lessons. And I'll have a slideshow that I've put together to go along with the reading. And then there'll be questions, time for questions at the end. And so now you get to watch me attempt to multitask as I set things up. And also you, you get to see my, my lack of spatial ability as I try to do this in a very timely way. Okay. And so I'm almost there. Okay, there we go. So that should, you should be seeing the the first um, slide, which is the title of the talk is, can I get a confirmation on that? Just? Yes. Wonderful, okay. So I'm gonna be reading from the seventh lesson called Our Brains Can Create Reality. Most of your life takes place in a made up world. You live in a city or a town whose name and whose borders were made up by people. Your street address is spelled with the letters and other symbols that were also made up by people. In fact, every word in this book that I'm reading from uses these made up symbols. And you acquire books and other goods with something called money, which is represented by pieces of paper or metal and plastic and is also completely made up. Sometimes money is invisible flowing along cables between computer servers or traveling through the air as electromagnetic waves over a Wi-Fi network. You can even trade invisible money for invisible things like the right to board an airplane early or the privilege of having another human serve you. You actively and willingly participate in this made up world every day. It is real to you. It's as real as your own name, which by the way, was also made up by people. We all live in a world of social reality that exists only inside our human brains. 
There is nothing in physics or chemistry that determines that you are leaving the United States and entering Canada, or that an expanse of water has certain fishing rights, or that a specific arc of the Earth's orbit around the sun is called January. These things are real to us anyway, socially real. The Earth itself, with its rocks and trees and deserts and oceans, is physically real. Social reality means that we impose new functions on physical things collectively. We agree, for example, that a particular chunk of Earth is called a country, and we agree that a particular human is its leader, like a president or a queen. Social reality can alter dramatically in moments if people simply change their minds. In 1776, for example, a collection of 13 British colonies vanished and was replaced by the United States of America. The world of social reality is also deadly serious. In the Middle East, people disagree and even kill each other over whether a parcel of land is Israel or Palestine. Even if we don't explicitly discuss the fact of social reality, our actions make it real. The boundary between social reality and physical reality is porous, and we can use scientific experiments to reveal this. Studies show that wine tastes better when people believe it's expensive. Coffee, labeled eco-friendly, tastes better to people than identically unlabeled, identical but unlabeled coffee. Your brain's predictions steeped in social reality change the way that you perceive what you eat and drink. You and I can create social reality with other people without even trying because we have human brains. To the best of our knowledge, no other animal brain can do that. Social reality is a uniquely human ability. Scientists don't know for sure how our brains develop this capacity, but we suspect that it has something to do with a suite of abilities that I'll call the five C's, creativity, communication, copying, cooperation, and something mysterious called compression, which I will explain. First, we need a brain that's creative. The same creativity that permits us to make art and music also lets us draw a line in the dirt and call it the border of a country. This act requires us to invent some social reality, namely countries, and impose new functions on an area of land like citizenship and immigration that don't exist in the physical world. So think about that the next time that you pass through customs or even when you leave one town and enter another. Our borders are completely made up. Next, we need a brain that can communicate efficiently with other brains in order to share ideas, such as the idea of a country and its borders. Efficient communication for us usually means language. For example, when I tell you that I need gas, I don't have to explain that I'm talking about pumping. I don't have to explain that I'm, I'm talking about my vehicle, not my digestive system, and that I plan to drive to a gas station in the near future, get out of my car, insert a plastic card into the pump for payment and so forth. My brain conjures these features and so does yours, allowing us to communicate efficiently. Strictly speaking, words are not necessary for social reality on a small scale. If your car and my car meet at an intersection and I wave you, I wave for you to proceed first, you can observe my hand motion, guess its meaning and use it yourself in the future. But for social reality to spread and persist, language is usually more effective than other symbols. Imagine trying to establish and teach a country's driving laws without words. We also need brains that learn by reliably copying one another in order to establish laws and norms to live in harmony. We teach these norms to our children as we wire their little brains to their world. That by the way is lesson three. We teach 
uh, these um, norms to newcomers, not only to smooth day-to-day -day interactions, but also to help the newcomer survive. I've read about explorers in the 1800s who ventured into inhospitable, uncharted parts of the world where many of them died. The expeditions that survived were the ones whose members became acquainted with the indigenous people in those regions. They taught the explorers what to eat, how to prepare food, what to wear, and other secrets of survival in an unfamiliar climate. If individuals had to figure out everything for themselves without copying, our species would be extinct. We also have brains that cooperate on a vast geographic scale. Even the most mundane act, like reaching into a kitchen cupboard for, can, for a can of beans is possible only because of other humans. Other humans planted and watered those beans, perhaps thousands of miles away. Other humans mined the metal for the can and still other humans transported beans to your local store, which was built by other humans with wood and nails and bricks that were manufactured and hauled by other humans using techniques and tools invented by other humans long dead. You paid for the beans with money that was invented and blessed by a government of other humans. And thanks to a shared social reality, all of these thousands of people were in the right place at the right time doing the right things for you to grab that can and make dinner. Creativity, communication, copying, cooperation, four of the five C's arose with genetic changes that gave our species a big complex brain. That by the way is lesson two about brain complexity. But large brain size and high complexity are not enough to make and maintain social reality. You also need the fifth C, compression, which is an intricate ability that humans have to a degree that is not found in any other animal brain. I'll explain compression first by analogy. Imagine that you are a police detective investigating a crime by interviewing witnesses. You hear one witness's story and then another and so on until you've interviewed 20 witnesses. Some of the stories have similarities, the same people involved or the same crime location, some stories also have differences, like who is at fault or what color the car, the getaway car was. And from this collection of stories, you can trim down the repetitive parts to create a summary of how events might have occurred. And later, when the police chief asks what happened, you can relay that summary efficiently. A similar thing transpires among neurons in your brain. You might have a single large neuron, the detective, receiving signals from umpteen little neurons at once, the witnesses, which are firing at various rates. The large neuron doesn't represent all of the signals from the smaller neurons. It summarizes them or compresses them, reducing redundancy. After compression, the large neuron can efficiently pass the summary to other neurons. This neural process of compression runs at a massive scale throughout your brain. In your cerebral cortex, compression begins with the small neurons that carry sense data from your eyes and ears and other sense organs. Some of this data may already have been predicted by your brain that's actually lesson four, prediction. <laughs> but some of this sense data is new. The new sense data is passed by the smaller neurons to better, larger, better connected neurons, which compress the data into summaries. And those summaries are passed to still larger, more highly connected neurons, which compress those summaries and pass them to even larger, even more connected neurons. The process continues all the way to the front of the brain um, to the most, um, all the way to the densely wired front of your brain 
where the very largest, most connected neurons create the most general, most compressed summaries of all. Okay, so your brain can make big, fat, compressed summaries of summaries of summaries. What does that have to do with social reality? Well, compression makes it possible for your brain to think abstractly. And abstraction, together with the rest of the five Cs, empowers your large, complex brain to create social reality. Usually, when people talk about abstraction, they mean something like abstract art how you can look at a painting by Picasso and see a face in the cubes and shapes. Or they mean abstract math, like using algebra to rotate an object on its axes. Or they mean abstract symbols, like using a squiggle of ink on paper to represent a number and a column of numbers to represent your spending for the month. The psychological meaning of abstraction, though, has a different focus. It's not about the details of paintings and symbols. It's about our ability to perceive meaning in them. Specifically, we have the capacity to see things in terms of their function, not just their physical form. Abstraction lets you view objects that look nothing alike, say a bottle of wine, a bouquet of flowers, and a gold wristwatch, and understand them all as gifts that celebrate an achievement. Your brain compresses away the physical differences of these objects and in the process you understand that they have a similar function. Abstraction also allows you to impose multiple functions on the same physical object. A cup of wine means one thing when your friends shout congratulations and another when a priest intones blood of Christ. Here is how abstraction works. As your brain compresses data from all your senses, it integrates them into a co cohesive whole, an activity that we previously called sensory integration. Each time one of your neurons compresses its inputs to make a summary, that multi-sensory summary is an abstraction of the inputs. At the front of your brain, the largest, most highly connected neurons produce your most abstract multi-sensory summaries. That is why you can view dissimilar objects like flowers and gold watches as similar. And you can view an identical cup of wine as either celebratory or sacred. I wrote in lesson two that you have a highly complex brain, but compl high complexity isn't enough to make a human mind. Complexity may help you climb an unfamiliar staircase, but you need more to understand the idea of climbing a social ladder to gain power and influence. Abstraction is another necessary ingredient. It lets your brain summarize bits of past experience to understand that physically different things can be similar in other ways. Abstraction gives you the power to recognize things that you've never encountered before, such as a woman with snakes for hair. You've probably never seen a real one, but you and the ancient Greeks could look at a picture of Medusa and instantly comprehend what she is because miraculously, your brain can assemble familiar ideas like woman, wild hair, and slithering snakes and danger into a coherent mental image. Abstraction also lets your brain assemble sounds into words and words into ideas so that you can learn language and understand it like you are doing so with this talk. In short, the wiring of your cerebral cortex makes compression possible. Compression enables sensory integration. Sensory integration enables abstraction. Abstraction permits your highly complex brain to issue flexible predictions based on, on the functions of things rather than on their physical form. And that is creativity. 
And you can share these predictions by way of communication, cooperation, and copying. And that is how the five C's empower a human brain to create and share social reality. Each of the five C's is also found in other animals to varying extents. Crows, for example, are creative problem solvers who use twigs as tools. Elephants communicate low rumbles that can travel for miles. Whales copy one another's songs. Bees use, oops, um, ants cooperate to find food and defend their nest. This is, uh, and bees use abstraction as they wiggle their bums to tell their hive mates where to find nectar. In humans, however, the five C's intertwine and reinforce one another, which lets us take things to a whole other level. Songbirds learn songs from their adult tutors. Humans not only learn how to sing, but also the social reality of, of singing, such as which songs are appropriate on which holidays. Meerkats teach their offspring to kill by bringing them half dead prey to practice on. We learn not only about killing, but also about the difference between accidental killing and murder, and we invent different legal penalties for each. Rats teach one another what's safe to eat by marking palatable foods with an odor. We not only learn what to eat, but also which foods are main courses versus desserts in our culture and which utensils to use. Other animals such as dogs, great apes, and certain birds also have brains that compress signals to a degree so they can understand things abstractly to some extent. But as far as we know, humans are the only animals whose brains have enough capacity for compression and abstraction to create social reality. A single dog might develop its own social rules like that of a particular, like that a particular grassy area is playing for is for playing with humans or that pooping is not allowed inside the house. But a dog brain cannot communicate these concepts to other dog brains efficiently the way that human brains can convey concepts with words to make social reality. And since we're showing dogs, I just had to just uh, slide in a picture of my beloved Luna, um, who is a COVID puppy. We got her as a puppy and she's now a big girl. Chimps can observe and copy one another's practices like poking a stick into termite holes to pull out tasty snacks. But this learning is based in physical reality, namely that the stick fits into the termite holes. This is not social reality. If a troop of chimps agreed that whosoever pulls a particular stick out of the ground becomes king of the jungle, that would be social reality because it imposes a sovereign function on the stick that goes beyond the physical. Most animals have evolutionary adaptations that make them specialists in their niche, that their environment that they live in. Like an antlers, like the uh, an antlers of an elk or an anteater's tongue. But humans became generalists. Evolution blended the five C's into a potion that spurs us to bend the world to our will, or at least try to. All animal brains pay attention to things in their physical environment that are relevant to their well being and survival, and then they ignore the other stuff. But humans don't just select stuff from the physical world to create our niche. We add to the world by collectively imposing new functions on things that didn't evolve to have, or they didn't, aren't designed to have those functions, and then we live by them. Social reality is human niche construction. Social reality is an incredible gift. We can simply make stuff up like a meme or a tradition or a law. And if other people treat it as real, it becomes real. Our social world is a buffer that we build around the physical world. The author Linda Berry writes, we don't create a fantasy world to escape reality. We create it to be able to stay. 
Social reality can also be a huge liability. It's so powerful that it can alter the speed and course of our genetic evolution. One example is the tragedy of the Romanian orphanages when a government ruled that, a cre that uh, the, when government rules created a generation of humans who were effectively removed from the gene pool. Another example is China's one child policy in which in a culture that values sons over daughters led to more male offspring than females and ultimately to millions of Chinese men who cannot marry Chinese women. This sort of artificial selection happens in every society where wealth, social class and war empowers one group over another because it changes the odds that certain people will reproduce with each other or at all. Social reality even changes the course of human evolution when we simply share our creative ideas, such as the technology to build to burn fossil fuels, which has produced a physical world that is now less under our control. A really striking thing about social reality is that we often don't realize when we make it. The human brain misunderstands itself and mistakes social reality for physical reality, which can cause all sorts of problems. For example, humans vary tremendously, like every animal species does. But unlike the rest of the animal kingdom, we organize some of this variation into little boxes with labels, such as race and gender and nationality. And then we treat these labeled boxes as if they are part of nature when in fact we build them. Here's what I mean. The concept of race often includes physical characteristics such as skin tone. But skin tone is on a continuum and boundaries between one set of shades and another are placed and maintained by people in a society. Some try to justify the boundaries by appealing to genetics. While it's true that skin tone might be heavily influenced by genes, so are eye color and ear size and the curvature of toenails. We, as a culture, choose the features of discrimination and draw the dividing lines that magnify the differences between the group we call us and the group we call them. Those lines aren't random, but they aren't stipulated by biology either. And then after the lines are drawn, we treat skin tone as if it's a symbol for something else. And that is social reality. You uphold social reality in your everyday lives. You do it every time you treat sparkling diamonds like they have value, every time you idolize a celebrity, every time you vote in an election, and every time you don't vote in an election. Our behaviors can also change social reality. Sometimes the changes are relatively small, like when using the pronoun they to refer to a single person instead of a group. At other times, the changes are cataclysmic, like the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, former country of Yugoslavia, which led to years of war and genocide. Another example is the Great Recession of 2007, when some people in fancy suits decided that a bunch of mortgages had dropped in value, and so they did drop in value, plunging the world into catastrophe. Social reality does have its limits. After all, it's constrained by social, it's uh, constrained by physical reality. We could all agree that flapping our arms will let us soar into the air, but that won't make it happen. Even so, social reality is more malleable than you might think. We could all agree that dinosaurs never existed, ignore all evidence to the contrary, and then build a museum about a dinosaur-free past. We could have a leader who says terrible things, all captured on video, but then news outlets could agree that the words were never said and that's what happens in a totalitarian society. Social reality may be one of our greatest achievements, but it's also a weapon that we can wield against each other and it's vulnerable to being manipulated. 
democracy itself is social reality. So social reality is a superpower that emerges from an ensemble of human brains. It gives us the possibility to chart our own destiny and even influence the evolution of our species. We can make up abstract concepts, share them, weave them into a reality and conquer just about any environment, natural. This is by the way, the, um, the Mars um, rover, political or social, as long as we work together. We have more control over reality than we might think. And we also have more responsibility for reality than we might realize. Every type of social reality is a dividing line. Some dividing lines help people like driving laws that prevent uh, head-on collisions. Other dividing lines benefit some people and hurt others such as slavery and social class. People debate the morality of such dividing lines but like it or not, each of us bears some responsibility every time we reinforce them. A superpower works best when you know that you have it. This is essay seven, lesson seven from my book, Seven and a Half Lessons about the brain. You can uh, find out more about this book and uh, my other book, How Emotions Are Made and also multiple stories, um, articles and um, uh, opinion pieces and so on that I've written for other popular um, news outlets. Uh, and for now, I will thank you for your attention and take questions. Yeah, so let's go ahead and open the chat to questions. Dr. Barrett, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, while the questions come in, I have a, I have a follow-up about the triune brain um, and a lot of what you just said about social reality. Um, so with social reality, you described it as imposing a sovereign function beyond the physical. Um, and you also, in your book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, debunk the triune brain. Um, and because of that, you're kind of questioning and uprooting assumptions about a lot of Western law and economic theory. So I'm curious, um, how do you go about questioning assumptions that kind of uphold society's foundation and where do you um, draw boundaries or not? Well, the triune brain in case people don't realize is this idea um, of the structure of the brain that comes from a mistaken idea about the structure of the brain which comes from a mistaken idea about the evolution of the brain. So the idea is that, um, that your brain is structured in three layers, triune as in three parts, that you have a lizard brain um, for um, your instincts. And then layered on top of that, you have um, a, a limbic system, limbic meaning border, border of the lizard brain. That's in, comes from ancient mammals, which is where your emotions live. And then layered on top of that, you have a cerebral cortex, um, like a, icing on an already baked cake, um, which is uh, for your, um, where rationality lives. And this idea that the brain evolved in three layers um, and that it functions in three layers um, really comes from Plato. This idea that your brain is a battleground between your inner beast, you know, emotions and urges and instincts and rationality, which is, you know, your human characteristic and the two battle it out for your behavior. And as Gabby mentioned, this idea is really embedded in economics. It's embedded in Western legal theory. It's the foundation really of um, the legal system in the, uh, particularly in the criminal justice system in the United States and, and in many Western countries around the world. Um, and it's wrong. <laughs> as a model of brain evolution, it's wrong. As a model of brain function, it's wrong. Um, it may feel to you like you know you're you're 
constantly your whole life is a battle between emotions and rationality, but that's actually not what's going on under the hood. Um, so to answer your question, um, Gabby, um, the question of you know whether brain function um, should be used as a guide for the legal system, say, is actually a highly it's highly debated. This is actually something I took up in how emotions are made. Um, I believe it's chapter eleven in how emotions are made. Um, you know there. There's a, uh, I'm the chief science officer of the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior at, um, at Massachusetts General Hospital. And there's a belief in, in many countries around the world that, um, that we should be using neuroscience to sort of, neuroscience actually evidence in the courtroom to adjudicate responsibility and culpability. Um, and that, um, that, you know, um, that the moral system, which is the moral norms, which are encoded in our legal system should reflect um, our best available knowledge about how brains work. But that's highly debated, I guess, is what I would say. Um, um, not all legal scholars assume that neuroscience is really a good guide for understanding um, what makes somebody culpable. For example, um, in the US legal system, I don't know how it is in France, but in the US legal system, you're considered less culpable for a crime, less responsible for a crime, um, if you that crime was committed when you were emotional than when you were rational, assuming that rationality is the absence of emotion. But the way that your brain is wired, you're you're never without feeling ever, even when you're at your most rational, you're never without feeling. And so the absence of emotion is not evidence of a rational mind. It, it's probably evidence of a, being a psychopath, actually, if you never have any feeling. So the, I, you know, I don't really know how to answer your question in the sense that um, in the legal realm and to some extent in, um, uh, you know, economics, I think probably what people would say is these are flawed metaphors, but they, they're flawed metaphors when you compare it to the neuroscience, but they're good enough. They work well enough, um, you know, in everyday life. I guess what I would say is, particularly in the legal system, I think there've been oftentimes miscarriages of justice because there's been a misunderstanding of how brains actually work. And I, I also, really why I wrote this book is because I think science and philosophy really are tools for living. And if you understand a little bit about how your brain works, um, then that's a tool for, uh, for living a better life, um, being more responsible for yourself and maybe more responsible also for the, the, for the care of other people who are around you. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, the joke in economics is always, you know, the first class you take, they tell you that you know, we're rational people and then it all comes undone from there. Um, we have some questions about prediction um, in thinking about the moment we're in now, um, a developing digital age. Um, are you seeing any trends on how this is affecting our stimulus response? And can you speak to how um, it might be changing how our brain is predicting or just how, that, how that's working um, in a digital age? Well, um, I'll first say that your brain doesn't respond by stimulus response. That's just um, also a, it feels that way to us, but that's actually not what's happening under the hood. So your brain is structured. In fact, every brain on this planet is structured to predict because predicting and cor predicting what's gonna happen next and correcting is actually much more metabolically efficient way of running a system. Um, than it is to just simply react to things that happen um, in the world. And um, metabolic efficiency is something that your nervous system cares very much about. And actually is a, you could think of it as a, an evolutionary, it's something that, that really, um, it's, a, it's a selection pressure um, that shapes evolution. So nervous systems really have to be metabolically efficient. And this is particularly true for humans because 
your brain is basically about like 20% of your metabolic budget. It's the most expensive organ you have in your whole body. And so if your brain is not functioning in a metabolically efficient way, predicting well, um, then, uh, you know, the, you have an increased likelihood that you will develop a metabolic illness like diabetes or heart disease or depression or Alzheimer's disease, all of which have a metabolic basis. Um, the digital age, I would say it's, that's, it's, that's a hard question to answer because the digital age covers a lot of territory. Um, I will say that interactions online are harder to predict because there are fewer cues. And anything which is harder to predict, which is more ambiguous or more uncertain, is um, more metabolically costly. So to put that in simple terms, it's just more stressful. Because what is stress? Stress is just your brain predicting that a big metabolic outlay is necessary. That's it. Um, and so when something is uncertain, it's, it's more stressful. Sometimes that stress can be good. Um, it can be helpful, healthy, it could be like a exercise for your brain. Sometimes that stress can be bad um, and can pile up over time and um, lead you to be vulnerable to illness. So um, social interaction over the internet and in general is harder on social nervous systems like ours are like we're social animals. So it's harder on our nervous systems because of all the ambiguity. And you mentioned just now um, something you talked a lot about in seven and a half lessons about the brain, which is budgeting for moments where we might need um, more from our brain in like budgeting short and long-term um, amounts of energy um, taken from our brain. Is there a way to train your brain to um, predict when that energy is going to be needed? Or is that just something that comes naturally that's outside of our control? Well, so what Gabby's referring to is the idea, the met, there's a metaphor that I use to explain what your brain's most important job is. So your brain's most important job is not thinking. It's not being rational. Your brain's most important job isn't feeling or seeing or anything like that. Your brain's most important job is regulating the systems of your body to keep you alive and well. And it does this, the, the fancy name for this regulation is called allostasis. Um, allostasis, if we were to describe it, we could describe it like your brain is running a budget for your body. And it's running a budget, not of money, but of glucose and salt and water and oxygen and all the nutrients that your brain needs to keep you alive and well. And just like you, if you knew that you had a big expenditure coming up in your real bank account, you wouldn't just wildly spend it and then worry about how to make a deposit to replenish afterwards. You'd probably save up and make sure that you were you know, in, you were anticipating that cost and, and then preparing for it. And that's exactly what allostasis is. It's the brain anticipating the needs of the body and preparing to meet those needs before they arise. So when your brain goes to stand you up, it also raises your blood pressure so that oxygen can get to your brain as you stand. Otherwise, if it waited until after you stood, you would risk fainting and that's metabolically costly if you break a bone, you know, for, that's a costly thing to do. So your brain is always, um, it's always running this body budget in an anticipatory kind of way, in a predictive way. So for example, um, cortisol is not a stress hormone. It's a hormone that gets uh, glucose into your bloodstream really fast because it's predicting that you're that your, your, your cells will need it to do something really quickly, right? Really energetically, right? So before you wake up in the morning, you have a surge of cortisol. Before you go to the gym, you have a surge of cortisol. Before you go to the fridge, you have a surge of cortisol. You know, anytime you have to move your body or anytime you have to learn anything new. And so the answer to your question, um, Gabby, is yes, there are things that we can do to make it easier or, or more difficult for our brains to predict. So here's an example of something um, that um, I don't think most people know, and that is really heavily processed food or junk food um, 
breaks the association between the sweetness of a food and how much calories, actually how much glucose it contains. So you may think you're doing yourself a favor um, when you um, have an artificial sweetener uh, or an artificial fat um, um, substitute that um, has few calories in it. You may think that that's a good thing to do, but actually it's a horrible thing to do because what this means to your brain is that sometimes the taste or the flavor or the mouthfeel of a food predicts calories and sometimes it doesn't. And that's ambiguity and that's bad. What you want are things that are pretty predictable, right? So a way that you can train your brain to predict better is by um, um, instructing your brain with new experiences and then practicing those experiences over time. So when I go to a new culture or I eat a new food or I listen to a new music or I, or I talk to a person I've never met before, there's obviously some uncertainty and some novelty in that, which is gonna be a little bit more expensive. But I think about that like exercise. When you exercise, you're making a big metabolic investment, right? You're spending a lot, but you're gonna replenish what you spent and you can think about it as an investment in a healthier brain and a healthier mind in the future. And the same thing is true for cultivating experiences for yourself. Every new thing that you allow, that you, that you um, curate for yourself to learn is an expenditure, but you can get a dividend on that expenditure if it's something useful for your life. So for example, uh, there's research showing that um, awe, the emotion of awe is actually very, um, it's very good for you because it gives your, it gives you, you know, if you can feel like a speck for, for five minutes, then it means that all your problems are also the size of a speck. You can kind of give your nervous system a break. So as a scientist, I'm like super, super skeptical of this. I'm like, I totally don't believe it, but I'm just gonna try it. That's what the research shows. So I'm just gonna try, I'm gonna see if it really works. And so I practiced making awe for five minutes a day, you know, so I'd be walking out on the street and I'd see a little like weed, you know, ugly little weed popping up from a crack in a sidewalk. And I would work hard to cultivate, see the beauty in that and cultivate a moment of awe at the power of nature, not to be, not to be, you know, uh, constrained by uh, humanity's attempt to, 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 uh, to constrain it. And sure enough, you know, after I practiced it a few times, it was hard and effortful, metabolically costly, but after I practiced it a few times, it became really easy um, to do. And my brain could just turn it on, you know, whenever I kind of needed it really automatically. And it became really easy for me to predict when I needed it and just like, just do it. So the answer I think is um, uh, things that you want your brain to predict easily, you should practice. And things that you don't want your brain to predict easily, like ruminating and things like that, you should really avoid. Oh, that's a great lesson on how to develop ourselves. And I definitely will, I took notes on practicing awe. I think this is a good moment to transition to placing this into the context of history and evolution. I have a question here of, and I don't even know if we can answer this question in its entirety in the time we have left because the, I have someone asking, why did humans develop such large complex brains? Is there an abridged version of this? Yeah, so I would <laughs> say um, we aren't the only animals with large brains uh, and we aren't the only animals with complex brains. So other animals have complexity too. Um, we just have a bit more of it. <laughs> um, and other animals have large brains also, you know, so our, for example, you know, our cerebral cortex um, which is where a lot of this compression happens, is um, about as big as you would expect for a primate of our size. It's not, we don't have like an unusually large cerebral cortex relative to say a chimpanzee or, or, um, or a gorilla or whatever. For, you know, we have a brain at the size that it is and given the brain, given the size of our brain, you know, we, the size of our cortex is about as big as what you would expect it to be. Um, but, the complexity of the brain comes from 
or is associated with the complexity of a body. So one of the things I was most interested in when I was starting to write this book was like, why do we even have a brain? It's very expensive. Like, why do we even have one? And the answer is uh, because we have complex systems in our bodies. So, you know, if we go back 550 million years ago, um, uh, animals didn't have brains on this planet. No animals had brains. Um, and uh, they also had very, very, very simple bodies. They didn't have eyes, they didn't have ears. They really had no, they had no sophisticated senses of the outside world and they had very few internal systems. They had a really simple gut, no heart, no lungs, nothing like that. But as bodies got bigger and more complicated under the selection pressure of predation, of hunting, um, uh, he, the animals developed brains. They developed bigger bodies with more systems and those systems needed a command center to be coordinated with each other. And so um, we developed a brain. Um, other animals have brains. I mean, all vertebrates have brains on a very basic plan that we share. Our brain plan is also very similar to like the basic vertebrate plan. Then there are invertebrates who have brains. I saw somebody ask about um, an octopus brain. An octopus doesn't have many brains. An octopus has one brain, but it's a highly distributed brain throughout their whole body. And for us, we don't really, we don't really have that. Our brain is really centralized in, in one place. Um, and there are lots of, I mean, an octopus can do fairly complex things, but, you know, it can't um, build skyscrapers and it can't, you know, build something to get to the moon. So the human brain, um, uh, with its complexity, um, allowed us to do other things like start to, you know, other animals communicate well, but we communicate with language and that really, you know, supercharged communication. Um, uh, you know, other animals um, can impose functions on things like a stick becomes a tool, um, but we can do this completely with imaginary things um, like making, you know, up something completely. I mean, if you look at all the things that have ever served as money in throughout the course of human history, um, we go from rocks and shells and salt and barley to pieces of paper to basically a promise that I might give you some pieces of paper later in the future, which is a mortgage, right? Um, and, or, or air rights, that's my favorite, where you take the, the air above a building in New York or any city is actually sellable just because a bunch of people agree that it was worth something. And so then it was because they agreed that it was. Um, so it's not really just the complexity of the human brain that's important. Other animals have complex brains too. It's that all of these things were evolving together in an entwined way that um, uh, in a very large complex body. And that's a really important point because your brain's main job is to control your body which means everything you think and feel and see and everything you do is in the service of controlling that body. And you may not experience every happiness that you feel or every hug that you give or every insult that you bear as having anything to do with your body, um, but it does. That's interesting, the conversation about octopus, we we're having a debate in the library the other day about if it's still, if we still think it's ethical to eat octopus knowing what we know about how complex their brains are. I stopped um, eating octopus. You did? Uh, I did yeah. a number of years ago, actually. When I started reading research papers on octopuses, I, I, I stopped eating octopus because I just can't do it. I can't Yeah, do it. yeah. Um, it's hard being in a country that touches the Mediterranean, but it's, it's, it's hard to ignore the the case for the octopus. Um, it's interesting what you said about predation. Um, and we have a question here about instinct or what, what we've known as instinct. Um, and is that a combination of experience and um, like a compression to survive? When we ex experience what we find to be feeling, feeling threatened or feeling in danger, is that also just like you said, like just um, information from our body or? 
Well, let's just be really clear that everything you feel, you feel in your brain. You don't see in your eye, you see in your brain. You don't hear in your ear, you hear in your brain. You don't feel things in your body, you feel things in your brain, right? So there's a, a well-known book, you know, The Body Keeps Score. The body does not keep score. The brain keeps score. And the body is the scorecard. That's really the way to think about it. So I guess what I would say is that um, your, um, your brain um, is, um, how do I say this? Because things happen so autom because things are happening predictively, to you it feels like they're happening very automatically. Um, uh, so um, you know, you see a snake, you react really quickly, um, and to you it feels like this triggered off some kind of survival instinct in you because it happened so fast and it kind of like you know kind of took you over and hijacked you and so on. But that is really not what's happening. <laughs> That is really not what's happening in your brain at all. Um, your brain is basically predicting when it starts to hear, when, as soon as you hear the rustle of leaves, you know, your brain is starting to, starting to predict what could that rustle be? Like when you hear a loud bang, what is that loud bang? It could be any number of things. It could be, um, you know, a truck backfiring. It could be somebody slamming a door. If you're in the United States, it could be a gunshot right? If you, when you feel a tug in your chest, what is that tug in your chest? Is it anxiety? Is it that you, you know, you have heart, um, uh, you have indigestion because you ate too much for dinner? Is it um, the beginnings of a heart attack? You know, your brain doesn't know. It has to guess. It's receiving sense data from the body and from the world, but it has to guess at the meaning of those sense data. It has to guess what caused them because the sense data are just the outcomes of some change. Your brain has to guess and it's guessing predictively. So you are preparing, what is a guess? A guess is actually literally your brain preparing to act. So when your brain hears like a rustle of in the leaves, it's predicting. If it's predicting a snake, it's pre that prediction is the preparation for you to run away. It's the prepare, preparation for you to literally see the snake. Your brain is changing the firing of its own neurons to prepare the response. And then it waits for the data to come in from the brain and body and uh, come in from the world and the body to confirm that prediction or to change it. And sometimes if your life is really on the line, the brain won't wait. It will just execute the prediction without checking. So, the answer is for the most part, most of the things that we experience as reflexes or instincts are really not. They're just exactly the same thing that allows in baseball, that allows a batter to wind up, take a swing and swing at a, at a ball that the batter can't see. The batter starts to prepare that swing and starts to make the motor changes to, to swing at a ball before he sees the ball from the pitcher because his brain is predicting where the ball is gonna be in a moment from now and swinging at that prediction. If he didn't do that, he would never be able to hit the ball fast. He would never be able to mount the response fast enough to hit the ball. So the same thing that allows us to have games like baseball and football and soccer and so on is exactly the same thing that allows us to jump away when there's a snake or a spider or any of these um, instinctual um, the things that we experience as being very instinctual. And it's not like your brain is evaluating, gee, is this threatening for me or not? Yeah, okay, it might be so I'm gonna jump away. No, the evaluation is the preparation of the action. It's just, your brain is just asking itself, figuratively speaking, the last time I was in this situation, what was the cause of that rustling and what did I do about it? And then your brain starts to prepare um, that response. So that when you see that snake slither out in front of you, you're prepared to run. And if you don't, if the snake doesn't slither out in front of you, you still might see a snake and you still might run. Well, I think you said it best with the brain keeps the score and the body is the scorecard. Um, 
We have so many great questions here, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Um, Dr. Barrett, thank you so much for being here tonight, for your presentation, for your reading, um, and for answering our audience's wonderful questions. My pleasure. Thanks to everyone for, for coming and uh, good evening. Yeah, we oh, hope to you. have you in Paris, back in Paris, uh, when times are a little bit different. That would be lovely. I, I will look forward to that.